So hey guys, I'm Jessica, and I'm Ivory. Uh, and today we're talk we're gonna talk about the film Pira Le Fou. This film was uh, directed by Godard in 1965. Yeah, and starring uh, Jean Paul Bel uh, Belmondo and Anna Karina. And uh, this film was based on uh, the novel Obsession by Lionel White and. Uh, the premise of the story is about Ferdinand, who is a respectful family man who lives, uh, who works in a literary field, and who has a uh, a well-off life and a good family. But all of a sudden, he abandons everything and runs away with his ex-girlfriend ex Marianne uh, to live a life of adventure, self-discovery, crime. Uh, however, the uh, his journey eventually leads to self-destruction, and the period. Um, like refer, uh, refer in the title of the film uh, also refers to the nickname that Marion gives to Ferdinand and like in the traditional sense period uh, means a sad clown and I think it has also uh, something to do with the overall theme which I'm going to delve deeper into and uh, Jean-Luc Godard created this film as a response for the Hollywood con uh, conventions, like Hollywood's generic work, uh, and the current American political climate. Um, yeah. Okay. So this film was originally filmed and made in 1965. It wasn't released in the United States until four years after that in 1969. So it had a whole round of releases in France before even coming to the United States. And France actually used this film as its submission under the best foreign language film category at the 38th annual Academy Awards. Unfortunately, it did not win. It wasn't even accepted as a nominee, but like France thought it was good enough to submit, so that's something. Uh, it was also shown in, co in competition at the 26th Venice Film Festival in 1965. And there it had really mixed reviews. The audience, uh, it was booed, so people did not like it, but on the other side of that, critics also thought it was important film and like appreciated it. Aside, in addition to that, it was also shown at the fourth New York Film Festival and one, review, one reviewer said that it was like the saving grace of that film festival, which was otherwise not as, not as great in its selection of films being shown. And oh, Godard, along with another director, Pierre Paolo, Pasolini were the only two in the film to have like two submissions. In this film, Piero Lefou was at was shown along with his other film, Masculine Feminine. And then when it finally came to the United States, it opened in 1969, New York at the second 72nd Street Theater. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to talk about some of the special techniques uh, that Godot utilizes in this film. And one thing that stuck out to me the most about this film is the color scheme. I think uh, like this film has beautiful, beautiful color, but I think like color is just not just like for an aesthetic reason. It's also, it's also like uh, like character symbols and like it also acts as a representation of what is going on in the film. And uh, as we mentioned before, there's also some non-traditional use of editing, like other French New Wave did, and um, other uh, French New Wave film did, and like such as like discontinuity editing and jump cuts. And there's also like a lot of uh, conventions of breaking the fourth wall and communicating directly to the audience, uh, as well as the use of intertextuality. So now we're gonna uh, look closely at the color scheme of this film, and then like. Um, the use of the color blue and red is like the strongest use of color in the entire film. Um, in, a, in, in the beginning of the film, um, throughout, actually throughout the entire film, uh, Marianne, the, the character that uh, Anna Karina plays, is almost always wearing something red. Uh, as we can see in the first image here, she's wearing this bright red dress. And um, uh, whereas Ferdinand, he was wearing like a more bluish color clothing or more uh, dull color clothing. Um, however, by the end of the film, uh, he is wearing this like bright red shirt with like blue, uh, and he painted his own face blue. And then like, it just shows kind of like his transition from 
like a uh, a well-off bourgeois uh, man to like to like a madman, and I think by doing so, um, Ferdinand also becomes period uh, period like a madman that Anna Karina has always referred to. So it maybe it's a it's a way to say that maybe perhaps the madman lived inside Ferdinand this entire time, but he's only manifested uh, by the end of his journey, where uh, because like he cannot discover who he really is. And um, uh, as uh, for Anna's case, because at the end of the film, uh, Anna is revealed to have betrayed Ferdinand. And like during the time when he was really, uh, like the, the, the couple was wearing, uh, facing some turmoil in the relationship, he wears, uh, she wears a really a faded pink dress, which kind of like symbolizes the, her feeling of being trapped and being stuck in a particular place. Yeah. Uh, another thing I wanted to say about that image, her dress is faded because they're like, I think it's because at this point in the film, they're secluded on this island. She's away from the adventure and the guns and the mayhem that she loved. So she's kind of subdued. And if you notice, like, um, Ferdinand's blue shirt actually has like a red stripe through it. So it's like the entire film is his transformation or his progression from, you know, blue to red at the end. And these images on the left side over here, they're taken from earlier in the film. Uh, Ferdinand and his wife attend this party. And at this party, Ferdinand's not really interested in anything that's going on. The people are like very absorbed and consumed with like products and like advertising and all this stuff that he doesn't really care about or is interested in. And like it's shot in these like monochrome colors, like each color, everything in the shot is just washed in the in the same tent and it really flattens out everything and exaggerates how boring this thing is to him it's very vivid but like it gives off the impression of being just like dull and like everything's the same and nothing is like exciting or different and next we're going to show you the trailer for the film Okay, so um, connecting back to the editing technique, I'm, I apologize for this because like we cannot find a clip that demonstrates this. But uh, one thing that stuck out to me the most is the use of uh, is how like in one scene, uh, period, uh, Ferdinand discovers that uh, Anna is lying to him, and then, like uh, when when he went back to uh, the apartment to find her, she she discovers that uh, she betrayed him. Uh, he discovered that she betrayed her. And I'm like, what uh, Godard uses uh, to symbolize is this. There's a scene where uh, she was cutting uh, 
across using a scissor and cutting across the the screen. And then I think it's almost like saying that she's like cutting the relationship, cutting the trust between uh, the two character. And I think uh, that is another um, editing technique to show uh, to showcase storytelling. And also, there's like uh, the use of intertextuality, as we've seen uh, in the trailer. There are many uh, paintings and like how uh, Ferdinand is constantly reading from a book um, involving um, other works of literature and art into this film. And then, like, I feel like sometimes like they're narrating the story through the use of other works. And now we're connecting to. Um, Brecht and film. So a little information on Brecht. Vitrol Brecht is a German writer, director, dramaturg, and uh, theater theorist. And he's the pioneer of epic theater. Uh, epic theater is not referring to like the skin of theater. It's not like it's not like what we think about uh, as like Iliad or Lord of the Rings, but it is rather a response to the current political climate that artists experience. And like it utilizes uh, like by interrupting the audience for uh, to draw attention for the characters who, to put in analysis, argument, and documentation uh, at, at the same time reserve the entertainment value of the piece. So what they do is that they uh, basically kind of like stop the narrative and like invite you to look at the, the story from an objective standpoint uh, rather than being engaged to it. And like that is uh, epic theater also uh, contains a distancing effect in which like they keep the audience from being completely observed the narrative and instead uh, be the conscious critical observer of the story. And he's uh, Brecht is also uh, known for works such as the Three Penny Opera and the Caucasian Chalk Circle. And we're gonna examine some passages from the Caucasian Chalk Circle to see how it's similar to Godard. And like in this uh, passage on the right, the noble child, there are like singers singing about uh, basically just like tell you the entire story, make you aware that you are watching a story, and like you like, they already unveil what's gonna happen, what is happening. So like you're just kind of like this observer looking at the the entire story and like how the characters gonna unveil the story. And like on the left, we have Grusha, who's the uh, uh, the protagonist who rescued the um, the son of uh, of kings and queens, and however, Grusha is now like this like she's like typically the character that we sympathize with the most. But then like and like she, we thought that because she rescued a child, she is this like noble good woman. But uh, here she's seen the bar like how she, she would rather she, she's not like that. She would rather like not um not be with this. Uh, have this burden on her uh, on her shoulder and so like we just kind of like step aside and then look at uh her character and this situation and kind of like make our own evaluation of that and now we have an example of a uh, period of uh, like them breaking the fourth wall Yeah, so as you can see, like there's a instance uh, where like I mean they're on the run, but like uh, typically like uh, when we compare this to Bonnie and Clyde, we don't like mean, we're we're just like completely observed absorbing the like, it's like we are the character, but like here it is consciously reminding us that we're watching a couple uh, on a crime spree. And here's another clip that is a kind of a subtle commentary on um the vietnam war and so here Ferdinand is playing this american official Yeah, so like this is also like uh, a little like commentary on the Vietnam War, and like it's like literally a story um, within a story to illustrate our current political climate. It's like the characters uh, being the narrator of this entire political climate and like observing 
the situation here. Okay, going back to like the making and production of this film, in order to stay in line with the source material, Godard originally wanted to cast two completely different people um, for the leads in this film. He wanted Richard Burton and Sylvie Vartan. Both of them were not available. Uh, they would have reflected the age gap that was seen in the book, like this middle-aged man, tired with life and bored of his situation, running off with this much younger uh, woman who was the babysitter for his family. But when those two were not available, he cast, went back to the classics, Jean-Paul Belmondo and Anna Karina, who had been, who had both been in other Godard films prior to this. And even in his own words, he says that the casting of those two completely changed the way he viewed the film he was making. And it shifted it from, like he says, like instead of Lolita, it came, it became like the story of the last romantic couple. He just wanted to see a uh, show these two running off together and seeing what type of adventures they get into. And there have been reviews that say like, this film is not just about uh, Ferdinand's passion for Marianne, but also the passion he finds for his writing as he's constantly seen like reading stuff at, like was said before, or like writing down his notebook and getting more in touch with his like artistic author side. Uh, next. Okay, so when this film was finally like released, like both in France and in the US all over, reactions were both good and bad. There were some people, like both, both critics and like um, general audience members who thought that this was probably like, one of the most poignant and the best film that Godard had done since Breathless. And then there were other people who thought it was just like, you know, classic Godard, like, repeating the same type of things like with barely there like kind of a flimsy plot that allowed for room for all the commentary that he inserts into his films and some people were kind of tired of it others were like he's still pioneering this new wave this pushing the bounds of what film can do but like despite the fact that like reviews were mixed over time people will look back on this film and think it was actually very important. Uh, next, please. Um, when it opened in France, it, it became the 15th highest grossing film of the year. It's not top 10, but that's still pretty good uh, when you think about how many films are made and released. And then, like I said before, like despite initial mixed reactions, it, um, became something that people loved. And then I said before that it was nominated, France nominated for the Academy Awards, but it didn't perform well there. The excerpt that I took out came from a review. Um, and in this review, this first, this critic calls Piero Le Fou, um, a powerful experience. He says that, um, Godard was again pushing at the forward limits of the kinds of things that motion picture can do and the qualities of feelings it can both convey and engender. And I think that with, despite the fact that this film, it does have a plot and it's kind of pushing you all over the place. Even with the play, there's a scene where they just start singing out of nowhere. Like, you know, they're walking through the woods and they start singing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even with that, like, it's kind of, it might be distracting you and like using distancing, but it's also like, throwing your feelings all over the place, the way the plot is going with these two people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry, um, this last little quote in the box here, um, this was actually written recently, um, not recently, but within the past 10 years, someone was going back and cataloging and looking back on all of Godard's films and he said, in his review of them that Pierre LeFou was like the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen in, in his life. And that, I don't think that's just owing to the color as we've talked about. It's like a very just visually pleasing film to look at. I think it was also referring to the plot and the, the breaking the fourth wall and all the other things we talked about. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was that this 
film came out towards the end of Godard and Anna Karina's relationship. And I think that in an interview that she did with a magazine, Anna Karina looks back on these films and is with very fond memories. Like she doesn't, she has no ill will towards them. And in the later film she did with Godard, she was more of a femme fatale. And I think a lot of people think that these films that they did together reflected, like it was a window into their relationship together. Like how it just changed over time and that also added to like kind of the not sensation not sensation but um just added another layer to the work they did together so all right that was Piero Le Fou. <laughs> yeah oh and uh actually like uh the fact that you mentioned song like I think like it adds on to the dismissing fact it's like Caucasian you talk circle, there's also like a lot of like songs and like, yeah. not, like we are interrupted, we're taken out uh, of the narrative by the song. So like, I think that's another way of like breaking the fourth wall, disrupting and uh, disrupting the narrative flow. Yeah. So okay. that's it. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, I hope this works. <laughs>